lots of people calling in from all over today. So um, yeah, as Jen mentioned, um, the purpose of my talk today is talking about ways you can get involved with community science through iNaturalist, um, as well as a really exciting event. So um, the goal of today's presentation is that I hope by the end of this, you um, are interested in making an iNaturalist account. Um, you'll feel comfortable making observations of wildlife um, and hopefully um, you'll be willing to participate in the City Nature Challenge that's coming up this weekend. Um, so what is iNaturalist? Um, iNaturalist is really an online social network of people who are sharing biodiversity information. Um, so it is a really great platform um, that is both a website and an app um, where just regular folks can contribute to scientific efforts. Um, so iNaturalist is really focused on biodiversity. So what that means is um, what different species or types of plants and animals do we see living out in the wild? Um, how can we capture that? How can we help make some additional records of that? Um, so the way iNaturalist works is that when you're making an observation, you're recording an organism at a time and at a place. Um, so because it's not just, just a photo, um, you're also adding in those other details about your observation. That makes it really great data um, that's publicly available and able to be used um, by scientists and other applications as well. Um, in addition to just being able to use it as a tool to record wildlife, um, it also is really excellent because it has a system to help you identify what you've seen. Um, so there's both the human side of that and the computer learning side of that on iNaturalist. So um, the people side is that there are lots of other iNaturalist users who are actual humans. <laughs> Um, who use the iNaturalist platform and will go in and look at your observations to see what you've looked at or see what you've observed um, and be able to help you identify what you've seen. So for example, you might observe something and say, oh, well, this is a bird, but I'm not sure what type of bird. Um, other users can go in and look at your pictures and observations and they can provide identification suggestions for you. Um, in addition to that, iNaturalist has their computer learning system um, that looks at your photo and that data that I was mentioning. So where you were, what time of year it was, um, and it'll give you an educated guess. Um, so you've got sort of two angles of help um, for figuring out what you're looking at. Um, the reason why the computer learning system works so well is because iNaturalist is such a huge database and there's been millions of observations um, over time verified by people, um, which then uh, taps into the computer learning system. Um, so you are able to use iNaturalist both on the website, which I will show a bit later, um, as well as the app. Um, it's, it's free, it's available on both Apple and Android. And um, that's really what I'm gonna focus the bulk of my presentation on today is the iNaturalist app. I'd say the vast majority of iNaturalist users use it through the app. Um, so we're gonna walk through how you do that today. Um, so iNaturalist began in 2008 and since then, um, users have made over 94 million verifiable observations. So this map that you're looking at um, is basically like a heat map of where all those observations have been made. So this is a global platform. Um, you can tell from the map that it's pretty North America and Europe heavy, um, but there are users all over the world, which is really exciting. Um, so to use this app, um, here's really the basics of what you're going to need um, to use iNaturalist. So um, you can use either just the camera on your cell phone um, or you're more than welcome to just use a regular digital camera. Um, it just kind of depends on what I'm observing. Um, birds, for example, tend to be pretty far away. Um, so it's hard for me to get good pictures of them with just my phone. Um, but if I use my digital camera and then just upload it later, 
um, I'm able to get some better pictures of birds. So totally just personal preference, but some sort of picture taking device um, you will definitely need. You're also going to need to set up an iNaturalist account. Um, so again, it's free. You can either do that through the website or the app. Um, having an account um, lets you make those observations and upload them. So without an account, you won't be able to post any observations to the site. You'll also need a, an internet connection. So um, whether that's just when you get back home um, or a library and you can use the Wi-Fi there, um, or you can turn on the data on your phone while you're out and about um, and use it while you're outside as well. Um, so if you haven't already, I would definitely recommend that you download the app today while I'm going through these first couple of intro slides. Um, that way, when we get to the walkthrough later in today's presentation, you can actually follow along step by step. Um, so feel free to, to take a moment to do that while I um, am going through the intro here. Um, so what are the reasons why we like using iNaturalist? Um, it's a really good way to connect people to nature through technology. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of an unconventional way, right? You don't really think cell phones and nature um, go hand in hand, but um, I find it's been a really successful community science tool. Um, it helps to sort of remove a, a lot of those barriers that there might be. So it's really intimidating to just go out on a walk um, and have no idea what species I'm looking at. And my only resources previously would have been like big, physical field books and field guides that are really complicated and use a lot of complicated keys and terms that only biologists really are familiar with. Um, but by using the iNaturalist um, app, it's really like having expert naturalists and all of the field books um, across all time just in your pocket. Um, so it's a lot easier that way um, to sort of learn nature through this platform. Um, I also like using iNaturalist because you get that help with identification. So like I was mentioning er earlier, you can either get help from actual users on the platform or just using the computer learning that's available to you as you're making observations. Um, I also like keeping track of what I've seen. So um, since you've gotten set up with that iNaturalist account, what it's gonna do is every time you're making an observation, you're adding to your life list. So you'll, you'll always have a nice um, list of, hey, here's all of the species I've ever seen um, in my life, which um, I think is cool. <laughs> um, especially if I'm traveling somewhere um, and I don't know anything about the species that are in that area. Um, I really love iNaturalist then, especially because um, it helps me get over that hump. So I'm in a new area, I don't know what I'm looking at, but with iNaturalist, I can learn um, new species and learn different habitats um, across the country or in different states. Um, the big picture of um, iNaturalist also helps to contribute to really big global publicly available science databases. So, um, they're really big believers in having this data be open and accessible. Um, so anybody that needs this data or is interested in looking at this data can really slice it and dice it whatever way they need for their research purposes or um, other things that they're trying to figure out about their species of interest. Um, lastly, it's free. Um, a lot of wildlife apps out there um, do have a cost associated with them, um, but iNaturalist is, is free. Um, so that's always good. <laughs> um, so when it comes to uh, all of this data that we're collecting, um, these are the reasons why having good biodiversity data um, and the health of community science data um, is important to us. Um, we honestly just cannot protect and manage what we don't know is there. Um, oftentimes, especially in urban and suburban areas, wildlife research has really been something that's been overlooked historically. Um, the mentality was just, oh, well, that's a city, like nothing wild lives there, why would I bother? Um, but through community science efforts, 
like the City Nature Challenge um, and others, we've been able to show that that's just really not true. Um, even in urban and suburban areas, you can still find um, a wide variety of species and even endangered and threatened species are included in that as well. Um, so in order for us to make good land management decisions and know where those good habitats are for things, um, we can't really make uh, good choices if we don't know that that's there. So having community science like this helps give us the data that backs up um, those decisions that we can make. Um, a naturalist and other community science sources are really valuable companions to your more traditional data sources. So things like Fish and Wildlife Service or um, Parks Departments um, here in Virginia, the Department of Conservation and uh, Resources. So uh, just kind of tag teaming the two together, um, you're able to get a more accurate, bigger picture of what is in the area um, instead of only the select areas where um, researchers have focused on. If your observations make it to research grade, so that means you've provided evidence for your observation and also at least two people have agreed that your species identification is correct. Those observations are automatically published to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, um, also known as GBIF. So um, this is again, a really large, database that gets tapped into quite a lot by scientific researchers. So um, iNaturalist records have been used in over 2,000 um, scientific literature citations. So your observations have the potential to be included in real scientific research, which is awesome. Um, so that brings me to why we're holding this webinar this week um, is because the City Nature Challenge is starting on this Friday. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and launch a poll real quick just to get a gauge on um, if folks have used iNaturalist at all before um, today's training, <clears throat> and also if you're familiar with the City Nature Challenge or not. So um, a poll should be popping up on your screen. If you could just take a quick moment and uh, click on the option that applies to you. Awesome. Okay. There's so many people. It's exciting watching all the results roll. Okay. That's just about everybody. All right, can you can go ahead and show the results, Josh? Um, so it looks like we've got a good mix of folks today. Um, majority of folks, 44% have never used iNaturalist before. Um, that's great, welcome. 31% um, have used it a few times and then 25% have used it many times. So, okay, got a, got a good, almost even split um, of folks today. Um, and then majority of you have heard of the City Nature Challenge, which is excellent, 67% um, of you. Um, the rest of you have not, but uh, I will, get into it now, so you will know about it. Um, so the City Nature Challenge is a um, community science effort um, that began in 2016. Um, it's an international um, bio blitz, essentially. So across the world, cities are going out and they are making iNaturalist observations of the things that live in their cities and urban and suburban areas. Um, it's held annually in April. Um, and it's quite a large effort. So um, I've put the results from the overall global um, 2021 City Nature Challenge here. So well over a million um, observations were made collectively in just the span of four days. Um, sometimes we do crash the iNaturalist website, but hopefully um, it will be able to handle all of us this year. Um, and this year, looking ahead to 2022, um, there are 450 cities that are planning to participate worldwide. Um, and since we have callers from all over today, um, if you're curious, if you have a city near you that's participating, um, you can check the city list at citynaturechallenge.org. Um, but for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm gonna be focusing on Virginia. Um, so I'm going to play this quick video. 
I'm share my other screen. Okay. Um, so this is just the promotional video for the City Nature Challenge this year. Look around you. Our cities are teeming with natural life that we need to understand now more than ever. Do your part by joining the 2022 City Nature Challenge. We can't fully protect nature on this planet without studying what is living in cities. Join over 400 cities worldwide to see how many wildlife observations we can gather together. Every photo or audio recording you submit helps further vital research around the globe. Using cameras and smartphones, tens of thousands of people will take pictures or record sounds of wildlife in their home cities. Building an international database of urban nature to help scientists and naturalists to understand life in our cities and work to make them better places for humans and wildlife to live. Go to citynaturechallenge.org to see if your city is taking part between April 29th and May 2nd. Then, take pictures of wild plants and animals and upload them to our global database using iNaturalist or your city's preferred platform. Watch as experts all over the world help to identify your observations. Join the 2022 City Nature Challenge or follow along. Discover the nature in your neighborhood and help change the world one observation at a time. some screen sharing troubles. One second. While Mara's getting that set up, um, sometimes the word city nature challenge can be, if you're in a rural area, it seems like you can't participate because it says the word city in it, but it does um, cover some rural areas, actually a good many. So for instance, in Virginia, the Eastern Shore, which is a very rural area, North Accomack and uh, Northampton and Accomack counties, um, that is part of the City Nature Challenge, even though there's not really any big cities on the Eastern Shore. So it's more of a location. And if you go into uh, City Nature Challenge in the iNaturalist app, it, if you go into the project, it will show you um, like what counties are covered in that area. So in the greater Charlottesville region, it's um, like a six county area. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> that led perfectly into my next slide. Um, so yes, there's quite a few areas of Virginia that are participating in the City Nature Challenge this year. Um, so I've included the map of all of those here. Um, so these are your options if you are located in Virginia. Um, so Washington, D.C. Um, bleeds over into Virginia. We have the Charlottesville region, Richmond, Hampton Roads, as well as the Eastern Shore. So as Jen was saying, it's not always or only just the, your super urban cities, um, as well as Blacksburg and Martinsville, Virginia. Um, so if you happen to be in or near any one of those areas, um, as long as you're within those county boundaries, so any of these areas highlighted in yellow here, um, and you're making iNaturalist observations during the dates of the City Nature Challenge, all of your observations are automatically gonna count towards those big City Nature Challenge totals. Um, so for us here at Nature Conservancy in Virginia, um, our Virginia headquarters is here in Charlottesville. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about primarily today. Um, so here's basically how the City Nature Challenge will work here in Charlottesville. Um, so as long as you are within the Charlottesville metro area that's highlighted here on the map, so that's green, orange, Louisa, Fluvanna, Albemarle, Nelson um, counties, as well as Charlottesville, um, and you're making an iNaturalist observation between Friday, April 29th at 12.01 a.m., 
um, to Monday, May the 2nd at 11.59 p.m., all of your iNaturalist observations are automatically going to count towards Charlottesville's City Nature Challenge. Um, if you're in a different metro area than all your observations in that same time period, will count towards whatever City Nature Challenge you are located in. Um, so that's really that first phase, the observation period. Um, so that's that Friday to Monday time span. That's really when you're going to go out and you're going to make those observations of the things that you're seeing on iNaturalist. Um, so that's really the focus during those four days. After those four days, that's when the identification period really starts to kick in. Um, you're welcome to start identifying things if that's something you're interested in um, the day the challenge starts, so April 29th. Um, but you have until May 9th to try and get your observations identified as best you can. Um, because at 9 a.m. on May the 9th, that's when the City Nature Challenge's international organizers are going to be pulling the results for each city. Um, so that'll be 9 a.m. at whatever their local time is. So it's just like a wave um, across the globe as the time zones um, get moving. Um, we've got a lot of um, events and things going on in the Charlottesville area over the next couple of days. Um, there are still some spots open if you're looking to volunteer or to uh, join a guided nature hike. Um, so you can find that on our website at nature.org slash city nature VA, um, which I believe Jen will be putting in the chat. But um, all of this is on the website. But just to give you an idea of some of the things we have going on in Charlottesville, um, a couple different bird walks, some nature hikes, frog and salamander hikes. Um, as well as some just fun events as well. So stream water testing, some garden tours in the area. Um, Ravana River Fest is a big event that's happening on Sunday. So um, if you're interested in, in getting out and doing something um, social for this, there are options available, um, but you are also completely welcome to do City Nature Challenge just completely on your own. It's a solo activity. Um, so uh, really just the main crux of it is that you're out and you're making iNaturalist observations or you're working on this species identification. So whatever you want your participation to look like, that's totally up to you. Um, so just to give you an idea of how we've typically uh, done here in Charlottesville, um, this is the results of our past four City Nature Challenges here. So um, we started participating in the City Nature Challenge in 20. 18. Um, so that was one of the first years where City Nature Challenge was international. Um, and you can see from this chart that gradually we've grown every year. So um, our goal for 2022 is just to continue doing that. So um, I would love to see us beat the number of observations and the number of species that we documented um, from previous years and, and top that number in 2022. Um, so that's the goal. <laughs> just beat ourselves. Um, so that's City Nature Challenge in a nutshell. Um, so at this point, I want to make sure we get into the bulk of today's training, which is how do you make these iNaturalist observations and what are the sort of tips and tricks to making a good iNaturalist observation? Um, so in order to understand that, I'm going to take you back to your third grade science class um, and have you recall um, Taxo the taxonomy ladder here. Um, so when we're thinking about species, this is the way that we have categorized um, wildlife and plants. So when you're starting at that big uh, level up, up top, so um, the red and the orange, you're thinking about um, the kingdom. So that would be either the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. Um, and as you go farther down this pyramid, um, you get more and more specific up as to what you're looking at. Um, so the way iNaturalist is set up is in this same pyramid style. So when you're uploading observations, you're gonna see it suggest things to you um, based on the taxonomy level that it's most confident is correct. So for example, if I took a picture of a tree, um, it might just suggest to me that, oh, okay, um, this is in the kingdom plants. Um, do you agree with this? And I would say, yep, yeah, this is a plant. Um, at that point, then other users could go in and be like, okay, I see this is a plant. 
I know this is a pine tree, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in like the pine family, for example. Um, so my recommendation to you, and especially as new users, um, is to just always go with the level of the taxonomy that you feel comfortable is correct. Um, so if all you know is this is a bird, this is a plant, uh, this is a frog, that is completely fine. Um, just put in your observations as that. And you can worry about um, someone getting it down to the species level um, later on. So that's what that's where those other users really come into play. Um, they can lend you basically their expertise and their knowledge to help identify um, those species there. So I'm going to share my phone screen um, and walk you through making an observation. Um, and then we're gonna do a practice observation together. So let me share my phone screen here. Um, and as I'm doing this, just a reminder that um, you're welcome to put any questions you have in the chat um, and we will have time in, in just a bit to get to some of those questions here. So um, what you're seeing now is my phone screen. So I'm logged into the iNaturalist app here. Um, I'm on Android. So the Apple app does look slightly different, um, but it's pretty much functions the same. Um, the main difference is Android has this green plus sign over here in the corner, and that's how you add your observations. Um, whereas on Apple, there's a camera icon in the center that says observe, um, and that's how you would make your observations in the Apple app. Um, so what you're seeing on my screen right now is my feed. So this is my account. This is how many observations that I have personally made. Um, and it's showing all of my most recent observations. So likely if you just made your account, this screen's gonna be blank right now. Uh, but as you start making observations, it's gonna fill in with that like list that we were talking about. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and tap the plus sign here. And that's going to give me a couple of different options of how I want to document um, the species that I am seeing. So um, my options are no media. So I don't have any sort of evidence. Um, you're welcome to use this. I use this a lot if I saw a bird, but then it flew away. <laughs> um, if it's gone, I can't really get any evidence of it. So um, I'll just pick no media in that case. Um, and then you've got your photo evidence options. And then you have your audio evidence options. Um, so take photo and record sound are the two options that you would use if you're doing it in the moment. Um, so if you're walking along, you wanna take that photo right then and there. Um, or if you're walking along and you hear a frog calling, you can record that sound in the moment. The last two, the choose image or choose sound are for sounds or pictures that you had taken at a different time. Um, so uh, you went on a walk earlier, but you didn't feel like having the app up while you were walking. Um, you can just use cho choose image and upload those things after the fact. Um, so if we were in person and doing this outside, um, I would do the take photo and record sound in the moment, but um, I am inside an office building. <laughs> so instead I'm going to walk you through the choose image um, path. Um, with some observations that I made earlier in the week. So this is gonna pull up my camera roll. These are some um, birds and things that I saw walking around my neighborhood earlier in the week. Um, so I'm just going to pick one species that I saw. So I'm gonna pick this bird right here. So that's gonna put your picture up here in the top. Um, if you wanna take a look at it, see if it looks okay, you can do that here. You can also use the pen icon on the bottom left to edit your photo in the app here. So my photo's kind of zoomed out. I'm gonna crop it. So now I can see my observation a little bit better. That looks good to me, so I'm gonna go back. Uh, if you wanna add multiple photos, which I'll explain in a little bit, um, you would do that by tapping this camera icon with the plus sign here. So if I wanted to add another image or if I wanted to add a sound to it as well. Um, you don't have to have just one picture or one piece of evidence for these things. So when you're on this screen, really the three things that you wanna focus on are the what, the when, and the where. 
Um, this is especially true if you're going to be using iNaturalist for City Nature Challenge. You want those things, um, especially the where and the when to be correct. So it needs to be within that four day observation window and you need to be within your city's um, challenge boundaries in order for your observations to get pulled into that project. Um, so my date looks good here and did that automatically. Um, my location, a lot of times that's gonna autofill automatically for you. Um, mine didn't because this was a picture that I took on my digital camera. So to fix that, I'll go ahead and tap on location. That is then going to pull up um, the world map. It always defaults to this point because um, this is zero, zero. So the latitude, longitude. Um, you can drag around on the map to where you are, um, or you can use the search tool here um, to search for the location where you were. So I'm just going to type Greenbrier Park, which is in Charlottesville. And that has given me my location. So if I knew exactly where I was, you're welcome to put your pin where that was. Oftentimes though, if I'm walking around in a park, I don't really remember where I was. So you can always zoom out your pin here um, and just make it go over the general area where you knew you were. Um, my only caution to you is just don't make your circles super big. Like don't make it go um, over half of Virginia. Um, because then that's going to kick you outside of the city nature challenge boundaries. So just try to stick with a, a close-ish circle. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and set this as my location here. So that looks good now. So I've got my when, I've got my where, and the last part here is the what. So the app, when I tap this, is going to take into account the picture that I took, where I was, um, and what time of year it is, and then it's going to give me a species suggestion. So it's telling me that this is a blue jay, which I know is correct. <laughs> if you're not sure, you can always tap these arrows here, and that's going to pull up the compare tool. Um, so you can look side by side at your picture on the top um, versus pictures that they know are accurate identifications of that species. Um, so you can get that side-by-side -side view and decide um, if the app is correct, if it's guess or not. So I do agree with this. I do think it's a blue jay. So I'm going to go ahead and tap that check mark here and that has identified it as a blue jay. And that's it. Um, so really it's just those three key things plus um, your evidence if you have it. So either a photo or, or a video if you have it. Um, the what, so what, what's your best guess at what that observation was, um, the when, and the where. Um, you don't need to worry about adding anything to projects. The way City Nature Challenge works, it's going to pull it automatically. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's going to pull it automatically into that City Nature Challenge project because it knows the location of the dates so that it's supposed to be. So I'm happy with this now. I'm done with this observation. I'm going to go ahead and tap that green check mark here and that's going to put it into my feed. Um, so depending on your settings, your observations are either going to be automatic upload or manual upload. Um, totally just personal preference. I have it on um, manual upload just because I tend to do a lot at one time and I don't want to completely go through my entire phone data plan in one iNaturalist session. So um, I'm just going to leave that here for now. But um, I, what I, I mentioned this just to say that if your observations have this light green color here, that means they haven't been uploaded yet, which means they're not going to get pulled into the iNaturalist projects. Um, so if you don't have auto upload on, just always make sure you actually press that upload button so that your observations actually get captured um, for the City Nature Challenge. Um, and that, that is how you make an observation. So I'm going to stop sharing my phone screen. And we're gonna practice making an observation off the slides here. So if you have iNaturalist up on your phone, now's the time um, to get that out. And I'm going to put two photos up here on the screen. You can pick whichever one you like. Um, and I want you to, Pretend like you're 
you're out on the trail and you saw one of these two things and make um, an iNaturalist observation of one of these. So um, I did pull both of these photos from the Charlottesville area. Um, so if your location right now is not in Charlottesville, it might give you an incorrect identification. Um, but I would love to see in the chat um, as you all make your practice observation of these, um, what people think these two species are here on screen. Um, I guess, Josh, are there any questions I could answer in the chat while folks are doing this? Yeah, sure. Um, so Terry asks, uh, it, does this take into account a large number of the same species? So if you take a picture and there's a bunch of blue jays in your in your same picture, will will it take into account the amount? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so no, iNaturalist does not take into account the number. Um, if you did want to take it, like um, get observations for each of the blue jays that you saw, you would have to make a separate observation for each of them. Um, but yeah, that is like a downside of this app compared um, to like eBird, for example, where you could just say I saw um, 10 robins and that's just one thing. Um, but yeah, it, if you want to count each of those, you would have to make an individual observation for each. Thank it's you. a convenient way to rack up um, your observation totals though, for city nature challenge, <laughs> if you're competitive. Um, do we have any guesses for these two species in the chat? Looks like a lot of people are saying that this is a great blue heron. Um, and also a, oh, a polyphemus moth. I That's probably pronounced both of those wrong, <laughs> but. That's fine. <laughs> I naturally uh, yeah, what it's I realized uh, I also did not look up how to pronounce the moth, but you're correct. Um, on the left, you're looking at a great blue heron, um, and on the right is a polyphemus moth. Um, so both of some these people, can be found in the Charlottesville area. Now, some people are getting um, eye, uh, owl eye moth as opposed to a polyphemus uh, moth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the computer learning isn't always perfect. Um, and again, it's taking into account like where you are currently. Um, so yeah, I, I love the computer learning, but you do definitely have to take it with a grain of salt sometimes. Um, it's not gonna be 100% correct all of the time. But again, that's where the, the users really come into play. People can go in and correct um, if something was identified incorrectly. Um, so don't, don't stress about it too much. <laughs> Um, just do your best guess. Okay, well, I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm going to cover some tips and tricks um, that I've picked up on um, from just making a lot of iNaturalist observations over the years. Um, so I really like this comic from Bird and Moon. I feel like it's very much applicable when it comes to iNaturalist observations. Um, the pictures and evidence that you're gathering are most of the time definitely not going to be National Geographic quality, and that is okay. Um, you really don't have to put the pressure on yourself to have this like perfect immaculate photo every single time. Um, you're going to have things that um, don't look maybe the way that you want them to, um, but that's all right. I, I think part of the fun of iNaturalist and community science, um, things like this, is that it's almost like a scavenger hunt or like a game, <laughs> almost. Um, so it's just part of it uh, that I find it enjoyable. Um, that said, these are some things that I would recommend if you wanna make sure that your observations are high quality um, and therefore have a better chance of getting to that research grade and being used in scientific, scientific publications. So um, these are the sort of four main points. Um, and these are my naturalist observations that I pulled again from the Charlottesville area. Um, I've put folks' usernames down here. 
Um, so a big one, especially for the City Nature Challenge, but also just on iNaturalist in general, um, is to try and keep it wild. So iNaturalist is really focused on wild plants and animals. Um, it really is not meant to be capturing a ton of data on things that are under human care. So what I mean by that is um, pets. So your cat, your dog, um, or like really manicured planted uh, gardens. Um, we obviously still like gardens um, and they are still providing great habitat, but in terms of the iNaturalist data set, they're concerned with wild um, plants and animals. So um, if you're out and making observations during the City Nature Challenge, um, you can make observations of those things under human care, but we encourage you to mark those things as captive or cultivated. Um, or just skip them. Um, so that's definitely the focus for this. Um, the second piece of advice would be to capture the detail. So in this example photo here, it's kind of hard for me to tell at first glance what I'm looking at. Um, but if you're able to crop the photo, like I was showing in the example, um, and really show the distinctive features of what makes that thing different. So what color is it? Um, how many legs does it have? Things like that. The more you can capture um, details that set that thing apart from other critters is gonna help you get a better identification. Um, I also recommend that you keep your pictures in focus. Um, this is often tricky with phone cameras, but um, just try to get a clear photo about, um, a clear photo of the thing that you are observing. So um, just double check your photo before you upload it. Um, and then the last one is multiple photos. So as I mentioned, if you want to, you can include multiple photos of the same uh, um, thing that you're looking at. So for example, if I was looking at a tree, I'm gonna get the best chance of getting a good identification if I'm including not only the bark, but also things like the leaves or the flowers or the cones. If I have all of those aspects in my observation, um, I'm gonna get a lot better guess at what species I'm looking at um, as compared to if I only have one of those things in my observation. So um, most of the time, one photo is gonna be sufficient, um, but in some cases, multiple photos are the best way um, to get that good ID. Um, so these are lowish quality observations. Um, and this next slide is how they could be better. Um, so again, um, we're showing wild animals. That's a box turtle in Charlottesville. Um, the second photo is the same mantis, but it's just cropped and zoomed in a little bit. Um, the third photo is still that same smartweed plant from the slide before, um, but I can actually make out the little flowers and things in it. Um, and then the last one is still that Virginia pine tree, but I've included now, I can see the needles, I can see the pine cones and that sort of thing. Um, so all of those things are ultimately going to help you get a better ID, um, which is great. Um, I'm going to pull up the iNaturalist website just briefly. Um, I want to make sure we have enough time to get to your questions and things today. Um, but I figured it was worth um, showing the iNaturalist website. Um, I find it's the easiest way to see all of the City Nature Challenge um, things that are going on. Um, but again, I'll just mention briefly, um, and we'll put the links to this in the chat. But um, again, if you're interested in coming to an in-person event um, in the area in Charlottesville, um, we've got lots of options for you to choose from. So I'm gonna um, stop my slides here, switch back to the website. Um, so now what you're seeing on the screen is, oops, sorry. Um, this is the species list of everything that's been seen most commonly in the Charlottesville metro area. Um, so actually the Eastern tiger swallowtail, so a butterfly species is our most observed species in this area, um, which I think is interesting, but uh, likely these are the types of things that you're going to see if you're out and about making observations during the challenge um, in the Charlottesville area anyway. Um, so iNaturalist is really great because it's basically a real um, 
like live in time field guide. So as more observations rolled in, the more accurate um, your field guides get for your local areas, which is nice. Um, once the city nature challenge starts, it's going to look similar to this project here. So this is our project from 2021. Um, so as I mentioned, we had uh, just about 1500 observations here. Um, and you can see the live feed as observations start rolling in. Um, and there's also leaderboards. So this is that competitive aspect I was um, mentioning. So um, if you're on a mission to be number one for most um, observations, this is where you would go to figure out where you rank um, in your city's challenge. Um, so it'll give rankings for people. So who has the most observations, who's got the most um, species, so who has the most variety, um, as well as the most observed species that you're looking at. So um, there's a lot of overlap, of course, with this list and the one I was just showing you. But um, it's always interesting to see what is most common out there. Um, and it will also populate on the map here. So you'll see where people are making this observation. Charlottesville is pretty heavy, um, of course, but we do, again, span out into those other counties. Um, so the 2022 project is currently empty um, because the challenge has not started yet. Um, but in two days and 12 hours, um, those observations are going to start rolling in here and um, you'll be able to see those leaderboards and things like that. Um, so uh, we'll provide links to, to these as well. Um, if you're interested, we definitely encourage you to join the project. So when you're logged into iNaturalist, um, you can join a project by clicking this area in the upper right hand corner here. Um, I'm already in the project, so the join button is not there. Um, but if you join the project, that will get you um, more updates about what's going on and what's being observed um, in your city's challenge. Um, and that's all I have. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes um, to answer any questions that folks have. So if you haven't already, um, please put your questions in the chat here and then um, Jen and Josh and I will we'll get to as many as we can. Um, if we don't get to everybody, um, we'll make sure that we follow up with you afterward. But um, yeah. All right. Well, um, I see a couple questions here about bird feeders. Uh, would that be considered like an unnatural, like a garden or something, or would that still be a uh, natural um, observation? Yeah. Um, yes, that would still be a wild observation. So yeah, you're allowed to attract <laughs> um, things to you, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's totally fine. Um, I really enjoy watching my bird feeder and observing those. Um, what about non-native species? Mm -hmm. Would we be able to take pictures of those and would, would that be an okay thing to upload? Yes. Um, yes, definitely. Um, and yeah, especially in these um, more urbanized areas, you're going to have a lot of invasive species. Um, I can pull it up on the on the website if we want to, but all it will do is it'll put a little pink exclamation point next to your observation. Um, that just lets people know that it's not native to the area. Um, but yeah, we, we actually want those observations. We want to get a better idea of where um, those invasive or not native plants are showing up. Um, it's definitely really valuable data. So um, yes, definitely feel free to make observations of um, those more like invasive or not native plants. Okay. Uh, there's also a couple questions about uh, if we need to join INA or join the City Nature Challenge before uploading the picture, or does it automatically uh, go to the City Nature Challenge database when you upload any picture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you if you're doing this for City Nature Challenge. Um, that's right. You do not need to join any sort of project ahead of time. That's not required. It's not going to affect your observations at all, um, whether or not you join a project. So yeah, as long as you are in that observation period, so this Friday to Monday, 
um, and you're within a, a metro area of one of the participating cities, it's going to automatically count um, your sale. Okay. Um, there's some follow-up questions about the original, the first question we asked about um, if there's one picture with multiple different Blue Jays in it, um, mm -hmm. uh, how it, would does that get counted? Um, there's some questions on if they should, um, uh, if, if it's a good thing to report mul the same individuals um, uh, in, in the same area, or should that be a, try try to get be avoided? Yeah. Um it's really personal preference. So um, the way I've had it explained to me is that a naturalist is an observation at a time and a place. So even if I went in my front yard, for example, and I made an observation of the same tree every day, um, what it's recording is a snapshot of it at that time. Um, so even though it's the same thing over and over again, um, making multiple observations of it is fine. Um, there are people that go in and look at like the, um, what's the word for it? Like the, the seasonality of the plants. So like, it does the knowledge is, is it blooming earlier than it was in previous years? Things like that. Yeah, that's great, Mara. I was just gonna chime in and say something like that. As people, particularly through climate change and they're seeing things bloom earlier and later and people are tracking that data. I think phenology of the plant. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, there's a question about the difference between iNaturalist and Seek. Yeah, good point. Um, so Seek is technically the kids version of iNaturalist. Um, so the reason that there's two separate ones um, is like a internet safety thing. Um, so because of the way iNaturalist is set up, um, it's users are supposed to be 13 years and older. And that's because like you're disclosing like public um, location information of like, here's all the places I've been basically. Um, so if you're not comfortable with sharing exact um, points, you are able to obscure your location on iNaturalist. You'd have to do that manually for every observation, but it is an option. Um, but yeah, that, that's the reason they've separated the two. So the assumption is that iNaturalist users are teenagers and up, um, and they'll be wise enough about not making a ton of observations like in their house, for example. Um, so Seek does all the same things as iNaturalist, but it removes the um, location part of it. So like there's not a, a pinpoint of this is where and when this thing was seen. Um, it's just the ID tool only, um, and those things are not recorded. So no seek data is ever going to be used like in the global biodiversity information facility or those bigger databases because it's missing that context. Um, you don't know uh, where or when, I guess, um, seek observations were taken. Okay. Um, there is a question. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm going to read it word for word. You might know what it means. Um, is it only going to ID from research grade AI? Is it only going to ID from research grade AI? Oh, I would lean towards yes. I, I don't actually know off the top of my head, um, but I would imagine so. Otherwise, I feel like <laughs> the AI would be wrong a lot of the time. So I, I would imagine that it's pulling from the proven correct um, identifications of a given species, and that's what it's feeding you as suggestions. Otherwise, you'd be getting all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, there's a few questions about just the IT logistics of the app. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, how do you log out of the of the iNaturalist app? Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually know. I've never tried. <laughs> um, I assume it's in. Uh, I'm pulling it up. I assume it's in um, your settings. Yeah. Um, 
So if you go to your settings within the app, if you scroll down to the bottom there, um, there will be a logout button um, within the app. Uh, logging on the website is, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's a button in the right hand side. Okay. Uh, make um, sure you upload your stuff though before you do that um, because otherwise it'll delete um, whatever's sitting in your queue. Um, so just make sure you've actually uploaded your observations before you log out um, or it might delete them. Okay. Um, we have another question. We have a question about the location circle. Um, so mm -hmm. if, if you're home, but you put the location circle in an area, um, in, in, in some area, but then the next time the circle is moved over, does that matter or does the lat, lat, la, lat, latitude longitude have to be exact? Yeah, um, let me actually share my phone screen again for that one. Um, so it does not need to be exact is the short answer to your question. Um, pull this up here. So I'm just gonna do the woodpecker this time. So if I press that compass icon in the bottom right here, the one that has the loading right now, that's gonna pull me to where I am currently. So I'm currently in our Charlottesville office. Um, but you can make this circle um, as big as you want, basically. So like, say you wanted, like, you know, it was somewhere in your neighborhood or near your house, like you could put a circle like around all of Pantops for um, example, um, or your neighborhood, whatever that might be. Um, it's, it's totally up to you. It's personal preference. Doesn't need to be exact. I do want to call out that we are at one o'clock. Um, we can stay for another minute or so, but if you have to log off, um, we understand. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, we appreciate your time and we do hope that you will enjoy using the iNaturalist app and will participate in the City Nature Challenge in your location. We will um, download the recording of this and send it out in a follow-up email later this week. Um, maybe we'll give you a sneak peek of some of the observations as they start, start rolling in on Friday. So we hope you'll participate. Thank you so much. Um, if you need to stay for a couple more minutes and have a specific question, we can get to that. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks, folks. So, um, if you have a, if you're still on and have a specific question and want to come off mute and ask that, uh, we can wait a few more minutes. Feel free to do that. I see Kim said on her phone, she selected to use Google to create the account, but she can't log in on the website. Won't accept the correct password. How do I delete the account and try again? I would probably, I would probably make um, a new account on the website um, and just remember what your login is on that. Um, log out on your phone, log in on the new account on your phone. Does that make sense? I tried that, but it said my email address was already, like it, it said the email was oh, already- like created. it's already in use. Yeah. Hmm. And I don't know why it won't take my, um, you know, Google email uh, 